Good morning. My name is Larissa Bezo, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Bureau for International Education. And on behalf of the entire CBIE team, it is my absolute pleasure and delight to welcome you to Virtual CBIE 2020. Au nom de toute l'équipe du BCEI, ça me fait un grand plaisir de vous accueillir au Congrès virtuel BCEI 2020. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to recognize that the land from which CBIE is hosting this conference is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today, their achievements and their contributions to our community. We honor their courageous leaders of yesterday, today and tomorrow. We offer this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of Canada. With a virtual global conference such as CBIE 2020, we recognize that each of us is connecting from different parts of Canada and around the globe. And as part of this process of territorial acknowledgement, we invite you to share your land acknowledgements through the chat function of our platform such that we can acknowledge the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples with whom we share land today in our respective places in Canada and around the world. It's an absolute delight to connect virtually with you today, officially to kick off CBIE 2020. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our conference delegates. We have more than a thousand delegates joining us for this week's International Education Conference with representatives from over 41 countries. CBIE 2020 marks our organization's largest and most diverse conference ever. C'est un plaisir absolu de se connecter virtuellement avec vous aujourd'hui pour lancer officiellement le BCEI 2020. J'aimerais souhaiter une chaleureuse bienvenue aux délégués de notre congrès. Plus de 1000 délégués se joindront à nous cette semaine pour la conférence canadienne sur l'éducation internationale. Nous avons des délégués de partout dans le monde représentant 41 pays. Nous avons un programme passionnant et dense qui vous attend cette semaine, et je sais que nous voulons tous avoir la conversation sur le contenu de la plénière d'aujourd'hui. It's my absolute pleasure to kick off today's CBIE 2020 conference. We have an exciting and densely packed program lined up for you this week. And I know that we all want to get to the substance of today's opening plenary conversation on inclusive and sustainable internationalization in Canada in a post-COVID world. Before we launch this conversation, I would like to recognize and thank ApplyProof for supporting this opening panel. I would now like to take the opportunity to invite today's moderators and panelists to turn on their cameras. Denise and Amber, it's my pleasure to pass this over to you. Larissa, thank you very much. And to all our participants uh, around the world and in Canada, welcome to this uh, wonderful session. It's going to be an exciting session. Uh, we have four uh, amazing panelists. Uh, I'll introduce the first two and my colleague, uh, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green will uh, introduce the other two. <clears throat> this panel, as you all know, is about inclusive and sustainable global uh, education. It's about uh, globalizing uh, access to education. Uh, it's about uh, new models uh, and new ways of thinking about internationalization of our universities and our societies. And I'm looking forward to an amazingly uh, rich and textured uh, discussion this morning. So I will begin with just telling you a bit about how we're gonna proceed. We'll start with uh, each of the panelists uh, doing a short uh, three minute presentation Thereafter, my colleague and I have um, questions which uh, we'll pose to the panelists. And uh, at all times, we're asking for your, uh, um, your engagement and uh, to ensure that uh, you use the chat function to uh, pose questions to us, which we will reflect back to, to, the, uh, to the presenters as well. So uh, with that, I will take a moment to introduce two of our panelists and uh, my colleague will uh, introduce uh, the other two panelists. This is not in any order, but uh, my two uh, colleagues that I will introduce first are uh, Hans de Witt, who's a professor and director of the Center for International Higher Education 
uh, at the Lynch School of Education and Human Development at Boston College in the US. Hans is a senior fellow of the International Association of Universities and the chair uh, of the board of directors of World Un uh, Education Services in New York and Toronto. He is founding member and past president of the European Association for International Education, founding editor of the Journal of Studies in International Education. The second uh, uh, speaker whom I will introduce is uh, Zabin Hirji, who serves as executive uh, advisor, future of work at Deloitte. Zabin uh, serves as a strategic advisor to the private, public and academic sectors and a director on corporate and not-for-profit boards. Prior to this, she had a distinguished career at RBC and most recently as Chief Human, Ro Human Resources Officer from 2007 to 2017. She is active in higher education. She is executive uh, in residence at Simon Fraser University, BD School of Business, a member of the advisory group on outbound student mobility convened by Universities Canada and Colleges and Institutes Canada and a former member of the Governing Council of the University of Toronto. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Denise O'Neill-Green. Uh, thank you, Amber, and welcome everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, very much looking forward to this conversation that we'll have this morning and, and just wanted to table the thought around uh, aspects of inclusion. Uh, as we know, inclusion oftentimes uh, sounds like a, a very nice uh, word and, and is something everyone wants to do. But when we truly look at the process of inclusion, it really takes into account various privileges, systems, uh, aspects of the ways in, in which certain groups are excluded and others are included. And it absolutely speaks to the kind of leadership that uh, CBIE uh, is looking to exert when we want to continue to produce global citizens. And as Amber mentioned earlier, focusing on greater access and students having very much a global experience. The two additional panelists that I'm very pleased to introduce to you today uh, are uh, professor Ronaldo Walcott. Uh, professor Walcott uh, is a professor of Black Diaspora Cultural Studies and member of the Department of Social Justice Education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, OISE, at the University of Toronto. Ronaldo recently served as the director of the Women and Gender Studies Institute, where he holds his appointment. His teaching and research is in the area of Black diaspora, cultural studies, and post-colonial studies with an emphasis on questions of sexuality, gender, nation, citizenship, and multiculturalism. Ronaldo is the author of Black Like Who? Writing Black Canada. He is also the editor of Rude, Contemporary Black Canadian Cultural Criticism Queer Returns, Essays on Multiculturalism, Diaspora, and Black Studies. And then we will also have Celeste Haldana, and she is the Chief Commissioner of the BC Treaty Commission. Celeste is a practicing lawyer and was appointed Queen's Counsel in 2019. The provincial government in BC appointed Celeste to the Legal Studies, excuse me, Legal Services Society Legal Aid, where she served as chair. She recently completed six years on the UBC Board of Governors and continues to serve on the UBC Indigenous Engagement Committee as the past chair. Celeste is a director of the Bryan Canadian. Foundation and the Mesquite Capital Corporation. 
She is an active member of both the Canadian Bar Association and the Indigenous Bar Association and an alumni of the Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference. Celeste is a member of the Sparrow family from Misqueen and is a Tuscan through Melakathia. She is the proud mother of three and grandmother of two. So what I'd like to do here is start off with uh, Ronaldo. Uh, as Amber indicated, each of our uh, panelists will have a few minutes to uh, speak. And so we'll start off with you, Ronaldo. Just turn on your mic. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Thank you, Professor Green, and thank you, Professor Saluji, for the introductions. And thank you very much to the leadership of CBIE for inviting me to participate in this conversation. I want to make four brief points that I think um, might serve as challenges or as um, moments to deepen, rethink, redirect international education in Canada and beyond. The first point that I want to make is that I think that we're going to have to begin to think of international education beyond the economic model. And this doesn't mean that we leave the economic model behind, but it really means that we um, enlarge what that concept means so that we can refocus how it is that income generation might allow us to access and include other populations that I believe in the long run would have other kinds of economic benefits. So that's the first point. The second point that I want to make is a point around sustainable global life and climate change. Um, and, and I make this point to, because it's going to relate to both point one and point two. But I think that climate change throws up a really important um, problem for international education in terms of who we imagine might be the necessary populations and audiences for, for this. And what's bearing on my mind is that this year, um, for instance, hurricane season in the Americas has been reported as either above our ridge or the strongest ever on record. Um, but it has not been widely discussed in our mainstream media, even though there've been one or two reports popping up. But I think that the impact of climate change holds a lot for how we understand what international education should do, what it should orient people towards, and what kinds of peoples and populations we should be thinking about um, when we think about who might be the target audiences for international education. And for me, that relates back to point one. But it also relates to point three that I'm going to make, which is about migrations. And you know, presently as conceived, international education understands its role in relationship to planned migrations. So it can account for people who are able to access visas, people who are crossing borders within the confines of international law and so on. But I think international, increasingly international education is also gonna to have to think about unplanned migrations because part of what will happen is that the impact of climate change is gonna force many people to move um, at rates and speeds that um, national and state le legislation can't account for in terms of how it attempts to manage planned mi plan migrations. So questions of visas, of travel documents, all of the mechanisms that we use for moving people around the globe are something that I think those of us, those, those of you who work in international education at the management and administrative levels are going to have to engage with. And fourth but not last, I think that we're going to have to prepare the wealthy North Atlantic for making sense of international education as something more than economics, um, but to think seriously and carefully about the unequal, the unequal exchanges that international education um, can sometimes reproduce, to think carefully and sustainably 
about moving international education outside of the purview of volunteer tourism and the kinds of mechanisms that international education has often been both critiqued for, but find strength in. And finally, I say all of that to, to make this point that I think that what we're in in the post-COVID era, era is going to require a new ethics of exchange in international education. And that new ethics, which is going to require a sustained thinking and research and, and building of relationships across multiple and different kinds of populations, it's the kind of ethics that I think on the rights of international education, which is to produce populations and communities who can live differently, but most important, live better together. Thank you. Thank you, Ronaldo. Really appreciate you setting off the tone there. So we'd like to move to Celeste to share your thoughts. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you, Aitwayel. So good day um, from the territory that I'm sitting on, which happens to be in Snanemo, and Haichka, which means thank you to the CBA for inviting me to participate in such an esteemed panel. Um, and as I was reflecting on some of the remarks that I wanted to make is looking at um, you know, the statement to build back better. And what I wanted to do is provide a bit of an indigenous perspective and a social justice perspective um, when it comes to the utilization of education and research to assist indigenous peoples and their communities uh, to protect indigenous knowledge, uh, utilizing internationalization as a mechanism not as a one size fits all, uh, but more as a conduit to assisting uh, international indigenous communities. And why I rely on social justice is that post-secondary education institutes new, I would suggest need to move beyond um, an economic or financial driver, particularly when we're in a global pandemic. And for me, what has become abundantly clear, and I think for others around the world, uh, those who are marginalized continue to be further marginalized when it comes to access to education, justice, and basic human rights. And there is a real issue when it comes to equity. And so some of the suggestions that I have about uh, the role of educational institutes internationally is to work in partnership with Indigenous communities so that we are protecting Indigenous knowledge, working in partnership with Indigenous communities, um, to secure ethnobotany and to ensure that their languages are being preserved um, as well as culture. And this can be protected for future generations because the transmission of education, culture and knowledge is integral to the cultural survival and dignity of indigenous peoples around the world, as well as ensuring that the vast resources in education and technology are made available to indigenous peoples and communities without being exploitative um, to the Indigenous peoples or communities. So I suggest a move to decolonize education, to remove barriers and access barriers. And to start to achieve the above includes, I think academic institutes require bold leadership, uh, partnerships, university strategic plans being inclusive of Indigenous peoples, communities, recognizing their inherent rights including supporting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's going to take innovation, new delivery platforms. So, you know, sometimes a move away from bricks and mortar. And I think that's what uh, this pandemic has also uh, showed how we can utilize technology to better engage, to re-engage and re-engage in uh, different ways. We're also going to require human and financial resources. So. Um, with that, I just wanted to say thank you. Those are some of my thoughts and heights up fast CM, which is thank you. Great. Uh, thank you to uh, Ronaldo and Celeste for starting us off on just such an amazing way. Um, I will now ask uh, Hans to uh, say a few words and then turn to Zabin. Uh, thank you, Anfer, and thank you, Denise. Uh, uh, bonjour and uh, good afternoon from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, although I am director of the Center of International Higher Education at Boston College, the pandemic has brought me back to my home country. Uh, and uh, that is also one of the opportunities that we have today. We can 
work from everywhere around the world and be still engaged with our local communities. Uh, thank you also, Rinaldo and Celeste, for your important uh, uh, contributions to the debate. Uh, inclusion and sustainability and internationalization are topics that are not new on our agenda. Of course, uh, we already for a long time as uh, researchers and uh, practitioners in uh, the field of internationalization of higher education have said it is important to be much more inclusive and much more focused on the needs of our society. But uh, this has become even more important in my view in the current uh, situation that we are in the world. The pandemic on the one hand, the uh, emerging uh, economic crisis related to the pandemic, the geopolitical tensions that have been clear and uh, uh, the current climate between China, Russia, India, um, uh, Australia, the US in particular, uh, and all that has its implications. And uh, also, as Rinaldo correctly pointed out, the uh, migration factor that as part of the environment, but also of political tensions. If you look, for instance, now at Ethiopia, which was a recipient of many refugees uh, from neighboring countries, now is also sending, uh, unfortunately, died to civil war, uh, a lot of refugees uh, to Sudan. And all that has implications for the way we operate in higher education and in our internationalization. Uh, we have to be much more aware than ever before that the way we have been dealing with internationalization has been very elitist and not very inclusive. It has been elitist in the fact that only a very small percentage of our students have been having the opportunity to go for degree mobility or credit mobility uh, to another country. Uh, we have seen that it is mainly uh, by a very small group of uh, children from rich uh, countries, that not all countries were part of that uh, internationalization effort. And also that many minority uh, groups, uh, ethnic groups, uh, indigenous population, uh, African-Americans or African-Canadians uh, have been only very marginally involved in internationalization of higher education. So that has been a challenge and is even more a challenge if you look into the, the future. Uh, the same is true with sustainability. Uh, sustainability uh, um, has not been very much in the forefront of our efforts on internationalization. We even have contributed to uh, the climate uh, change by the fact that we have been traveling so much. Uh, not only students, but also faculty, administrators have been very engaged in that. So we have been contributing, unfortunately, to the negative impact of our planet uh, by climate. Uh, and we, you could say to some extent, if we would not change our perspective to internationalization, we will con continue to include by being much uh, less elitist and much more inclusive to um, the uh, unsustainability of our planet. So we have to look differently how we address internationalization. And that has to be by focusing much more on global learning for all. Uh, having to work in our curriculum and the way we teach and learn in the way we operate and research, in the way we partner, uh, to be much more aware about the consequences it has for society and the consequences it has to for inclusiveness. And that we can do by using the technology that we have. As uh, also Celeste said, it is possible now that we can bring in the technology in our teaching and learning and in our research. And that is an opportunity. But an opportunity doesn't come by itself. We have to be actively making that change as educa international education leaders uh, to really be inclusive and working for a better planet for the future of our society. And we can do that if we act together around the globe to make that change happening. And with that, I finish my introductory remarks, but look forward very much to the further conversation. Thank you. Hans, thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. And Zabina, I'll now turn to you. Um, thank you so much, Anvar. And one of the uh, challenges with uh, with being the last panelist to speak, um, the, uh, many of the points, of course, are already covered. But one of the advantages you can build on some of what's been uh, been said already. Um, so, as as you mentioned, I work in um, all of the different sectors. So I look at this through uh, through really through this prism of different sectors. But I will underscore 
um, the, the business perspective, um, because there's there are a couple of points I'd really like to emphasize there. And, uh, and also just civil society. One of the uh, areas I'm involved in is chairing civic action, which is a, a, a civic engagement organization in the, uh, in the greater Toronto area. So the framing really for me is what's the role of higher education in producing global citizens? Um, and as I think about where we are today um, on this planet, um, it's become abundantly clear that we need to strengthen international relationships. Globalization has been in a state of flux uh, for quite some time, cooperation has deteriorated, but what COVID has reminded us is how interconnected the world is. Um, viruses don't know borders, our supply chain, um, uh, our businesses are global, and of course, most of us have family in many different parts of the world. Um, I counted mine in nine countries uh, is where I have immediate, uh, immediate family. So the strong international relationships um, are really, really critical to all of us, including to business. Um, and, um, and so how do we get more of the actors into this conversation to really look at it both from the perspective of it's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. Because for me, the economic impact and the social impact of the inclusiveness are really two sides of the same coin. Um, I wanna speak to two particular uh, approaches that, uh, that we've had. Um, and and you, know, you mentioned debate and I think I'd like to also set us up a little bit for a debate. Uh, one of them is uh, outbound student mobility. I do believe that that has an important place in this. Um, an international study experience is one of the best learning accelerators that you can find. It develops all of the future skills, um, adaptability, creativity, problem solving, empathy, and the list goes on. But importantly, really develops that ability to learn rapidly, which is something we've certainly seen come to life through the pandemic of how important it is for us to be able to come together and learn together quickly. Um, I fully acknowledge that this has been an elitist approach. The people who get the opportunity are ones who probably get those kinds of opportunities to be in other places anyway. Um, I'm uh, a study done in 2017 by universities um, UK, UK showed that the benefits of international learning, um, including improved academic outcomes as well as um, as well as job outcomes, actually accrue more to people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So what is what can we do to really change? who gets to participate because the impact and the delta to what they could have achieved, uh, would have achieved otherwise to actually enabling their potential is quite significant. Um, and that's where I'd like to have more of the conversation. Um, and I'll close off really by saying, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, technology, there's so much we can unleash to really have online international learning and again, business, I think, can play a big role in being part of um, how they can contribute and support that kind of learning uh, through directly being involved, as well as through leveraging, harnessing, accelerating the use of technology and the, the platforms uh, globally. Thank you. Thank you, Zavin. Really an, uh, uh, an exciting uh... Uh, a set of comments from you as well. And uh, to all of you, I must say, uh, you've set us off on an, an amazing journey for discussion now. And what a way to start off uh, the 2020 conference. So my first question uh, hopefully ties uh, uh, the thoughts of some of you uh, together, all of you actually together. Uh, and it goes back to uh, the, uh, one of the four points Ronaldo made. How do we develop a new model of uh, inclusive, equitable internationalization that goes beyond seeing international students as sources of revenue and makes education truly more globally uh, accessible? And to uh, Ronaldo, you posed that question to Zabine. You've asked that we think anew about um, 
how we can engage uh, the business community and how we can engage uh, civic organizations uh, uh, in the process of developing global citizens. Hans, to you, uh, you thinking about uh, global learning for all and uh, the carbon footprint of actually sending students and uh, faculty and uh, administrators abroad and bringing them to Canada. Uh, and to Celeste, how would that uh, impact uh, indigenous communities around the world? So thinking about new models, what does that mean? And how does that enable us to uh, take education to where students are and not simply think about bringing students to us and not seeing them as um, economic uh, generators uh, for the university? So I'll ask Ronaldo to kick us off. Okay, thank you for the question. I think the point in particular that I was trying to make is that one of the challenges for international education is, is to begin first with an acknowledgement that um, up until COVID and probably after COVID, it has been a practice of unequal exchange. And so the question becomes how to begin to level that out. If we're going to take seriously the question of inclusion and the question of sustainability, how do we level out this unequal exchange? Apologies, Ronaldo. We've lost uh, we've lost your uh, audio. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Apologies for that. My internet is going all kinds of ways. Um, so I think what I was saying is that in places like Canada, where international education has um, it's done a number of things, but two that I want to focus on it. It's been a really interesting recruiter for the Canadian population in terms of inviting students to study here who can then be, who can then use that as a route of, of immigration status to become members of the Canadian polity. And while I continue to think that that's important, I also think that that in of itself helps to fuel the unequal exchange. So part of what I think we have to think about is, so how can we resolve that? What kinds of mechanisms and, and practices can we bring into play? Apologies, lost you again. Move on to the next person. Uh, Zabin. Um, thank you. Um, so um, I think you asked me to comment on to really um, continue to, I guess, double click on how can business and civil society uh, play a role in this. Um, so as I think about uh, as I think about business, um, one of the things that we are seeing uh, very much the, the, the value of is work integrated learning and having students uh, being provided with opportunities while they are uh, while they are completing their higher education um, to have that kind of an experience. Uh, so as I stop to think about how do you make this global, uh, there are many uh, businesses that are that are global businesses. Uh, so how can some of these work integrated learning opportunities, for example, be provided in a different geography without the person actually going there. Uh, we know that we can work, we can use technology, we can work from anywhere. You know, Hans is a great example um, of, of somebody who's doing that. Um, and with businesses now, you know, COVID has been a great reveal of many things, including the inequities that, uh, that exist in society. And we are seeing Many businesses genuinely want to accelerate um, the, the path towards to address uh, racism and to, uh, to, to accelerate that path to more equity. And so can we actually use that, that uh, commitment and interest that we have already to actually um, make it easier 
for underrepresented students from underrepresented groups, uh, international students as well, who have a, often have a more difficult time um, finding um, those opportunities to to actually get the work integrated learning in an international context. Um, in terms of civil society, one of the things that I think we hear from uh, from students in um, in underrepresented groups as far as being able to participate in outbound mobility, as well as other ways of learning that might actually be um, more time consuming or require different kind of flexibility, they often um, have part time jobs. Um, they have family responsibilities that uh, that they need to attend to. So there, there's sometimes a need for a more of an ecosystem of support um, that goes beyond the financial support. Um, so is there a place here for uh, for civil society, for you know, for not for profit organizations to actually get involved to provide that kind of ecosystem support? Um, which, you know, which, which varies it, it dramatically, certainly, but that is an important piece. Um, and, and even in preparing students who, um, who are in, in, if they're going to, into outbound student uh, mobility programs to the country, they may need different kind of support uh, because they've not had these kinds of experiences before. And in order for it to be that learning accelerator, it's, a, it's not a one size fits all approach in terms of how they're supported. How do you consider culture, cultural differences, uh, for example, in helping to prepare and support people through it. And that's where I see this as being very much an ecosystem of, uh, of, of support that universities can't really um, do it as well or can't do it on their own. And who are the leaders? Who are the business leaders? Who are the civil society leaders that are going to step up and say, we're going to play a leadership role in this because building global citizens is good for our country, it's good for our business, it's good for our people. Thank you, Zabin. Uh, Celeste, a few words from you and then to Hans. And then Absolutely. I'll so um, really appreciate this rich dialogue because I absolutely uh, agree. There's a lot of barriers, uh, particularly looking at indigenous learners um, and access to education. We tend to be um, older entering into the university system uh, with, again, huge community responsibilities, um, often families. And I think there's, you know, the whole um, brain drain is something that we need to be really cognizant of within Indigenous communities because we're expecting learners to leave their remote communities, go into an educational institute where I think um, academically we can meet the needs of the community by, again, using technology to deliver education with right in the community so you don't have people leaving. Um, and again, it's about supporting capacity development within that community and rebuilding uh, their nations. And I think that's something that um, international education can critically play a role in. Uh, again, I need to emphasize that technology and the use of technology is going to be so important. One of the challenges that we also have is um, not to pick on Ronaldo with his internet, but a lot of our remote indigenous communities don't have internet. So I think we need to look at investments and in infrastructure investments, not just in Canada, but also internationally as well. And I think that's where partnerships with academic institutes, business, um, civil society, everyone can come together to ensure that we are, you know, investing in areas that we need to invest in um, and doing it in a strategic, thoughtful and um, partnership type manner. And so I do think there's huge opportunities. Great. Uh, thank you, Celeste. Hans, to you, and then I'll turn it uh, right over to uh, my colleague, Denise. Hey, thank you. Um... Well, let me first say, uh, and that's also in response to the debate that Sabine wanted to have. Uh, of course, I'm not against uh, physical mobility. Uh, physical mobility, I've been experienced myself, uh, a lot of it during my study time, and uh, it can be very important. Although there's no guarantee that it makes you the global citizenship uh, that we would like to, uh, because unfortunately we have enough uh, evidence that not always uh, students benefit from that experience so much because they are not integrated into the society and in the community they are. Uh, 
It's also true that we notice that uh, mobility is uh, not only, as I said, very elitist, only one to two percent of the whole population, student population around the world has the chance to go on mobility, either for a degree or for a, um, a credit. Uh, so it's in that sense very uh, elitist, but also uh, they go increasingly shorter uh, for uh, six weeks or two months and not anymore for a semester or a year. And that makes the experience uh, far less beneficial. Uh, I would not say completely unuseful, but still far less beneficial than a long-term stay. And also it adds to the, uh, the climate uh, uh, deterioration. So, uh, and what I would advocate much more is that we have to integrate mobility and in what we do as teaching and learning for all students. So uh, for those who really are making uh, having a, a comprehensive advantage of being on a mobility scheme either for study or for an internship because i think that's even more important to the, the surface learning experience than the study abroad as being international uh, they should be facilitated by institution to do that but the reality will still continue to be that it is a very small percentage and if we then ignore the over large majority of students of becoming global citizens of how you call that, because I think global citizens is a very um, fake term. Uh, but let's say that they have an understanding about what their future career as professionals and citizens will be, which is anyway much more interconnected. We have to shift into bringing mobility as one of the many instruments that we can have for global learning for all. And that, that is by using technology with all the disadvantages that Celeste has mentioned uh, of not people having actual to, access to um, Wi-Fi and internet, etc., or don't having a laptop, but we still have to use that. But we can also do it in the way we train our faculty to be much more global learners or to global teachers, and by that creating a global learning environment. We have to invest more in that. We have to make much more use of the possibilities to diversify the knowledge of our students, um, including issues of local, huh? the indigenous issue or uh, other aspects of social injustice within the country and bring that in an international perspective, saying that is not something exceptional to Canada only, but it's also happening elsewhere. And how can we learn from best practices? That is the kind of global learning for all. And in that mobility can be one of the many instruments, but it should not be the only one. And that is what we see currently that basically governments and institutions are so much focused on recruitment of international students, even not on sending out students abroad, but much more on the inbound and even not creating the kind of atmosphere where those international students can be integrated to society. So we still have a long way to go in that respect. Thank you, Hans. Over to the... Uh, thank you, Amber. And, and boy, I wish I could jump in while you all are talking. The, I would say the chat is pretty hot right now. So my question really picks up on what some of you have already started speaking to. And that is, okay, we know how we look pre-COVID. Now we're into COVID. And with some of the comments in the chat that's spoken to issues around technology and the requirements of that and how there are absolutely those within our communities who don't have access to that. But what about the additional barriers? Again, thinking post-COVID, the additional barriers of credentialing and so forth that blocks uh, and serve as barriers, systemic barriers to so many people. <clears throat> and then we have our neighbors in the South who aren't even interested in thinking about other parts of the world and are just focusing on themselves. I'm just saying that's a, a more or less a comment that also came uh, through uh, the chat. And, and then finally, the idea, well, really not finally, but integrating these very different learning opportunities post COVID. And I guess finally, my, my real question here is, uh, what does inclusive, sustainable higher education in a post-COVID COVID, excuse me, world look like, given some of those various background factors that I spoke to. And let's be honest, many do not wanna go back to what was normal. 
because what was normal excluded so many people and, and did not respect issues of equity. So in looking forward in a post COVID world, where do you see inclusive, sustainable uh, higher education being a possibility? And I'll, I'll go to you first, Celeste. Well, it should be access to all. And I think that's one of been the biggest barrier uh, systemically is, um, you know, again, it's based on education, based on colonial notions of who gets access because of resources. And um, I think we need to create uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, partnerships to ensure that um, those access barriers are removed. And I, you know, reflect really quickly on the Truth and Reconciliation 94 Calls to Action and the role of education. Education got us in this mess. Education is going to get us out of this mess. And there has to be uh, the ability for all to participate. Thank you. Uh, Ronaldo. we're going to go back to you. Hopefully that Wi-Fi will kick in. You're on mute. And here I am in the city of Toronto and even my Wi-Fi is spotty. Um, hopefully, let me, let me try to get this up really quickly. I think that there's been a lot of talk about building new in the midst of COVID but I've heard very little policy articulation about what that new will look like. So I think that's an urgent conversation that we need to have. But I think for higher ed, one of the things that Lost you, Ronaldo, sorry. Yeah. Maybe I can suggest, Ronaldo, if you maybe close your webcam, maybe the audio will work better. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, yeah. please continue. Um, you in, Den um, Denise, you invoked the US. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about in this period is that, you know, student loans in the US are absolutely out of control. In places like Germany, tuition have disappeared in the last decade or so. And places like Canada sit somewhere in between. And so if we're really thinking about rebuilding better, we have to totally rethink our priorities in relationship to higher education. And that, and that means reckoning with tuition and student loans and the kind of economics that it saddles graduating students with. But it also means then that we have to think differently about a whole set of economic priorities. And we have to think about, we have to take education out of the market model in a certain kind of way. At the same time, as much as we must think locally, I worry that sometimes the local can refract into becoming very small. So we have to balance thinking locally and acting locally and recognizing ongoing injustice within our local context at the international scale. So for instance, the work that I do, I know that many of the experiences that black people have in Canada nationally are shared by black people in France, England, the US and other North Atlantic countries. So we can use this understanding as a way to begin to address much more globally what the possible outcomes and remedies might be. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ronaldo. Zabine? Um, thank you. Um, so uh, maybe to build on the access point, um, there's definitely there's the, the, the tuition part of the access, which I think has been, uh, it's been well covered. Uh, but it, to me, it's more than just the financial um, access. It's what is the support that's provided in the you know K to 12 years to 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 have uh, to help people actually see themselves going to university, prepare themselves for higher ed. What's the support that's provided while they are at university? Um, what's the support that's provided to help them to transition to work? And and then what's provided once they are in the workplace? Because this isn't just about the getting access to people to start, 
it's really much over a much longer part of their life cycle. Um, and that to me, again, speaks to this multi-sectoral approach in terms of, uh, of how that's done. Um, and then the, the, the other point I would make is really around um, in terms of inclusion and equalizing is to build on the technology conversation that's, uh, that's happened. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm, um, I'm an executive in residence at the Beattie School of Business at Simon Fraser University, and they've been um, experimenting with this collaborative online uh, international learning model for a few years, and of course COVID has accelerated that. Um, it really uses a lot of existing uh, resources, but you know, the bottom line is it, it really allows um, learning to, to happen um, around the globe. Um, and uh, along with that, though, we need to solve the access to internet and high speed internet issue. Otherwise, this is actually could get worse uh, for the most marginalized people. Um, so that again brings in other players, including, you know, we talk a lot about government, but I think the internet service providers um, also um, have a role to, uh, to, to play in that sort of last mile um, delivery of, uh, of, of internet services. And to me, the whole technology issue also calls for that multi-sectoral approach. Technology is doing many things in many places. Um, how do we get more of that technology for good um, that's not just based on, on, on the immediate economics of it, but it's, it's, it's the macroeconomic. Healthy societies health really drive healthy economies or healthy economies drive healthy societies. Um, and so how do we step that up as well? Um, because clearly funding is a, real, is a reality for universities in terms of how they move forward on this. And so partners, I think, knowledge partners are critical. Absolutely, Hans? Yeah, th thank you all uh, for those observations. Uh, one aspect which we haven't addressed so much is when we talk about inclusive, sustainable higher education is uh, the role of the emerging and developing world. Uh, if we talk about inclusion, we have to realize that internationalization also is a very strong Western paradigm. Uh, is dominated by uh, the developed world, Canada, uh, United States, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, some countries in Asia, uh, Japan, Korea, um, including more China, etc. But still, uh, there is this uh, exclusiveness in the sense that uh, the rest of the higher education community in the world didn't have a possibility to be part of the internationalization uh, because they were basically used in that relationship and had not access to publications, they didn't have access to education, they didn't have access to research networks, uh, not to rankings, etc. So uh, that is in a very important part to keep in mind. And what I see as an opportunity of post-COVID is where uh, Canada and Europe and North America, etc., they want to go back to the business as usual. They want to start to recruit international students again. Uh, they don't care about uh, internationalization of the curriculum and global learning for all. But that issue is not there in the developing emerging world. They don't have even the means to compete on that. So they have to look and they are already looking at alternative ways to doing it. They are having a much more collaborative online international learning development. Uh, I see a lot of networkings of, uh, of universities in Latin America, for instance, who work together and say, well, Okay, our students cannot travel, they don't have the mean. Our faculty cannot travel, they don't have the mean. We have challenges with internet, but we, the only way we really can create a global learner is by doing it this way. And uh, making short term trips, uh, not going if, uh, only to Europe or the North America, but staying in the region and by that learning from its other experiences much better. I think that's a very important future of when we talk about inclusive and sustainable higher education, internationalization in the developing and emerging world. Thank you so much, Hans. And uh, um, let me say that Denise and I were uh, overly optimistic because between the two of us, we prepared uh, nine questions for all of you to ask. And we thought that this was going to take an entire half a day, but uh, Larissa uh, at the last minute told us it's only one hour. So we only got to two of our nine questions. 
Uh, and certainly uh, the chat has been amazing, absolutely amazing. So um, I'm going to have to unfortunately cut us off uh, prematurely and I'll ask- Well, La Larissa has actually indicated if we're willing, uh, we can go a little bit longer. Um, Indeed. Uh, 20 more minutes or so, if everyone is, is able to do so. Is that possible? Great. Amber, is that all right with you? So I think I'll kick it back to you. We definitely won't get through all these nine questions, but as you do the next question, we'll, we'll begin to look at additional questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, great. Thanks, Denise. And thanks, Larissa, for extending the session, uh, just because it is so uh, amazingly rich, uh, uh, as we know, um, and as we would have expected uh, from uh, the caliber of panelists that we have. So my question, actually, uh, Denise, uh, I will try and pull a couple of questions together uh, that we have uh, here so that we can ask uh, our panelists to reflect on. And that is, does uh, inclusive uh, globalization and uh, uh, inclusive sustainable globalization and the development of global citizenship look the same in the global south uh, and in the global north? And if it doesn't, uh, what accounts for that? And how do you think we should be moving forward if we're talking about inclusive globalization? And here I will start with Hans. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I already hinted that in my previous uh, intervention that it is uh, certainly the case that it is not the same. Uh, uh, it, we, uh, there's also, I see in the chat, a lot of discussion about what is global citizenship and is there a power relationship related to that. Uh, in the global north, uh, uh, we still uh, are looking at it from a very uh, Western perspective and uh, we don't include a different perspective. We don't include our own um, inclusiveness of, of, of groups like uh, the indigenous population and, uh, and other groups into our process. And we have to do that, but we also don't look at the rest of the world. Uh, but that, so that's a challenge. And uh, at the same time, as I said, I think post uh, COVID, there is this opportunity that now in the global South, there will be much more uh, uh, in need and an in, uh, inclination to change the Western paradigm. Uh, there will be no possibilities for the, um, the middle class and the developing countries to go abroad, uh, which was basically what happened over the past uh, decades was that the growing middle class and developing and emerging countries will, would have the possibility and the means to send their children abroad. The economic crisis makes that much less likely. So they have to look at different ways how they can do that. And uh, they will do it in different ways uh, by looking much more in their own context. And uh, so we will see a rise in South-South cooperation and partnerships uh, much more than in, uh, in the past has been the case. So uh, that, I think, uh, is also a way of thinking that we in the Global North have to realize that we have to be much more inclusive and less uh, dominant in our approach to the way we deal with internationalization of higher education. Uh, I've been involved in a whole debate about uh, internationalization for society, uh, which is uh, that we have to address much more the needs of the sustainable development goals uh, as a kind of what we do in our research and our teaching and learning. And I think uh, in that, uh, we have to also look into what does it mean for the South, what does it mean the North, and how we can much more collaborate than having this power relationship between the North and the South. Great. Thank you so much. Celeste, over to you. I was going to say, um, reflecting on some of the earlier comments with regards to um, the role of academic institutes, um, you know, I, I think of um, picking up on what Ronaldo was saying around the policy framework needs to completely shift um, when we're looking at access to education and being inclusive um, and moving beyond uh, the models that we have in place now. And, and I think the uh, leaders of education, so the, um, you know, the dominant countries that are uh, leading and charging in this way, also need to be reflective on um, 
you know, their role to change policy and change the mindset around this economic uh, driver when it comes to education and, you know, because that is a barrier. Uh, access to education and access to fiscal resources is a barrier for a lot. And I know with those developing countries, they're going to have similar issues. And um, I think they need to understand. So there's some of the pitfalls that uh, our education system has faced when it comes to, uh, say, for instance, burdening uh, students with huge amounts of debt, particularly in the US. I mean, I, I can't even imagine coming out of school with the type of debt that they have. Um, to me, that's not inclusive and that's not equity. And uh, when I think of education as being a driver for powerful change, we also need to be reflective on how are we going to change the mechanisms by which it's delivered, but more importantly, how are we going to engage in education and provide that best practice to those emerging uh, countries. And I think education could look quite, quite differently. And again, it's about equal access, equal opportunity, and moving beyond the colonial confines um, of education and the way that it's been structured to you know, to date. Thank you so much, Sabine, and then Ronaldo. Um, thank you, and and thank you. I think the the questions in uh, in the chat just around uh, what is a global citizen is is a good one. And um, um, and uh, my good friend uh, Google, the one of the ones that I found that I think uh, resonated with me is a global citizen is someone who's aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it. They take an active role in their community and work with others to make our planet more peaceful, sustainable, and fairer. Um, the, the one thing we haven't spoken about is, and you know, I'm, uh, I'm really most familiar with the Canadian context, is the number of international students we have here already. So a quick search tells me that we have about 650,000 international students. This year obviously is different, but, um, and my observation there would be is I don't think that we are really using that resource um, within, the, uh, within universities and colleges to help other students actually learn from them about their lives, their experiences. We talk, you know, we talked about online platforms and different ways of doing it. But here we have the globe coming to us, um, not to mention the new immigrants that we have to this country as well that are in universities and still very fresh with their experiences. Um, but I, I, I think that's something we can more systematically harness um, to, to build that the, the, to, and use them, their experiences, um, their, their relationships, connections to, to, to the countries that they're here from to accelerate building a global mindset, global understanding, understanding of world issues um, because they're already here. They've, the globe has come to us, yet um, I don't see a lot. I'm sure they're, you know, uh, and Denise, I know you're a moderator, you can't jump in. I know you do quite a bit at Ryerson and there might be some things you're doing, but I think there's, that's an untapped resource um, that's sitting there. And the benefit of that is, you know, it becomes a two-way street. Uh, we know many of them um, do end up staying in Canada, and you can argue, you know, the pros and cons of that in terms of their not taking back their um, their their learnings to their uh, to their home countries. Uh, but it would sure make for better integration as well if we started to um, to really see that as as a two way relationship uh, and one where their experience is valued. Um, and more, you know, we talk about harnessing diversity in organizations. What about harnessing the diversity in universities um, to to really um, to really strengthen um, the, um, the the students and the outcomes? Thanks, Irene. Uh, Ronaldo, you've also spoken about um, uh, uh, unequal exchange. And how do we uh, uh, in the context of the, the broader question that I've posed, how do we um, address that unequal exchange, how do we uh, enhance uh, mobility from the South uh, for students? Uh, and someone asked me actually the question in the chat, uh, how can we uh, uh, ensure 
that mobility from the southern hemisphere to the north is done in a way that they can return the anti-colonial gaze as opposed to the colonial gaze from the north to the south. That's a really good question and I hope my internet will be stable long enough for me to answer it. But I also noticed in the chat someone wrote about um, their daughter studying at Carlton from Jamaica and, and the exchange rate and the cost of, of, the, of that tuition. And, and so my comments lie somewhere between some, some things that Sabine has said and some things that Hans has said, which is that, you know, there are models in the South and Hans pointed to the one in Latin America. I'm going to point to the one that I know best, which is the University of the West Indies. It has three campuses in three different islands, but it also have units in other places. And what those units do is they allow for a dispersal of the work studying and so on that, that people across the region are able to engage. But when we think about those models, we don't think about them as constituting international education. We think of them as regional. And so at the base and the foundation of international education calls for some rethinking. And part of that then has ties into, you know, the logics of the ranking of, of higher education institutions, how those rankings then work to produce access to credentials and employment, which institutions credentials are immediately transferable in places like Canada in the North and which institutions are not. And, and this network, this naughty network of of all of these practices really work to create the unequal exchange that I began with, it really works to create a set of disjunctive relationships so that you can have someone with a master's in education from the University of the West Indies arriving in a Canadian city and somehow they have to redo that master's. That there's no understanding that they bring knowledge with them that can be fundamentally important and insightful to how we have organized our lives here. And, and it's our inability to grapple with, with that nitty gritty, but also the larger frame within which it sits, that I think it's going to be really urgent and really necessary post COVID, because I really believe that post COVID, we're going to see an intensified migration, set of migration issues. Thank you very much. And Denise, a, a question, and then I'd like to leave a little bit of time, uh, one minute each for uh, our panelists to give, uh, give us their final thoughts. So uh, Denise, over to you, and then a, a minute to each panelist before we wrap up completely. Okay, great. So in looking at the chat here and a few of the questions that uh, we had listed, basically what I want us to think about is, okay, what leadership is needed? to begin to execute this kind of change that we've been talking about. So there are racial biases that persist uh, in our source countries. What leadership is needed to counter these biases in our international recruitment structure and systems? And to add to that, not only the source countries, the universities, but also our governments uh, in promoting international education post COVID. How would it be possible, and this is a question that was sent through the chat, uh, how would it be possible to broaden their position in order to encourage inclusiveness, sustainability, rather than limiting, um, uh, again, this discourse to the economic development but yet at the same time, the economics of our students are very much central to this question as well. So I would turn to Zabine uh, to, to respond to this. Okay, I, I don't know what's going on with Sabine. Zabine, your mic is still on. So we'll turn to Hans. 
and have you start us out here. Well, uh, I mean, also looking at what is indeed in the, in the chats and the questions and answers on that topic, the, uh, we, we have seen that uh, both governments and institutions indeed have been putting very much emphasis on either the economic aspect or uh, like what, what uh, Jay Knight calls the, uh, the knowledge diplomacy or the soft power uh, as a kind of driving force for internationalization, uh, much more than looking at uh, what can we do for society and how can we be much more inclusive. Uh, it's also uh, a fact I was uh, over the past uh, days reading uh, as an ex external examiner a PhD thesis in Canada about uh, outbound student mobility uh, that in Canada there seems to be indeed no really clear stakeholders both in the business community among the higher education community and in the government com uh, community that are really thinking that uh, Canadian students uh, need the kind of the outbound experience uh, which in itself is quite shocking and is quite different than if you look into uh, and you can question the way it is what is happening in the United States where uh, Canada as uh, we know is something like four or five percent in the United States is uh, according to the latest figures uh, this week from uh, IAE 11 percent of the student population that has an experience abroad in, in some countries in Europe uh, like Germany it's uh, 30 percent to 40 percent that uh, are going abroad uh, and that's by the fact that this uh, that governments and uh, uh, the European Commission and institutions, but also the business sector say, well, it is important that we have a global experience and the global experience can indeed be study abroad. It can be uh, experience abroad by internships, but it can also be at home uh, in your own environment. Uh, and that's uh, what we have to stimulate much more in, 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 in sustainable development. But uh, so we have to shift again the paradigm from economic to much more um, development of an, uh, a, a learning experience, which is much more global. The whole dis discussion, which I saw also in the chat and the questions about um, what do we do with the term global citizenship? Uh, should we keep that uh, or is it um, much more again a, a power relationship or doesn't it say much? Uh, of course, everybody likes to use that term, but it sounds so nice. And it does, uh, at the same time, it's so general and it doesn't mean much. Uh, so let's use it. I, I even do it that's myself like sometimes. That's like inclusion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, but that's why I also prefer... Uh, my... If I can, sorry, Hans, uh, we're really running out of time. Okay, so sorry. if you keep people uh, limited, uh, I'd appreciate it. Okay. So, but that's basically why I used to call it global learning for all, which is much more effective. Thank you. Celeste? I was going to say, I'm going to get on board with that because it is learning for all and removing barriers. Um, and I think this has been such a rich conversation and I look forward to uh, further engaging. But there is something that we all can do, which is, again, be our own uh, advocates and ensuring that we're pushing the dial when it comes to significant policy shifts, when it comes to access to education, when it comes to removing barriers, um, when it comes to being inclusive. And we all have so much to give. We all have so much to learn from each other around the world. And I think that's the biggest part of it. And if we're not listening and learning from each other, I think we're gonna miss a huge opportunity to build better, brighter future uh, leaders and better, brighter communities, indigenous and non-communities, uh, non-indigenous communities around the world. Thank you for that, Celeste. Ronaldo. I think that as the climate crisis is an existential threat to the entire planet, that the question becomes, how do we produce leaders and here are leaders, especially those from the global south and, and indigenous communities around the globe who have a really profound understanding of the stakes of what we're actually living and what might be coming. And it seems to me that international education that rethinks itself through the prism of sustainability, a green economy, a green education, if you will, and an attempt to interrupt the climate crisis that seems headed our way at warp speed 
is for me the possibility of the dream to come. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And Sabine. Um, so just, uh, yeah, some, I guess, closing words. Um, I think the um, cross-sector collaboration um, needs to be turbocharged. Everyone needs to break down the silos. Uh, we need to start from uh, more of a position of trust um, in terms of people's motivations, different sectoral motivations, uh, because this is a critical issue to the future um of um of the planet um really um and um just in terms of the uh you know the uh, hands a little bit to to your point which i think is a really good one in terms of what's happening in canada there there is some momentum um there there was a a, a report um uh, of a study group that had been put together in 2017 that produced a report um i was part of that group um, it was then um, the, 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 the government did uh, announce money um, in budget uh, for um, accelerating the, uh, this, the, some of the programs. There obviously COVID has slowed it down, but Universities Canada and colleges um, uh, and Institutes Canada um, have, uh, you know, are taking this on for all of the universities together. And I would close by saying in terms of collaboration, I think there's a huge opportunity for universities and colleges to work together collaboratively, not competitively. This is the time. Uh, so when I think global citizen, I just think someone who thinks beyond themselves. Global can actually be in this, a mindset is, you know, it could apply in your own country. Um, how do we, um, I, the, I still sense a lot of there, it's, it's a bit of a competition and, you know, everybody is competing for students, international students, different things. Um, but how, what's the mechanism to, there's so many amazing things happening in, in this uh, sector um, and, and what's a way to come together um, and to build back better together and getting that multiplier effect um through that uh through through that uh, approach thank you for having me um as uh, on on this panel as uh, as a bit of the diversity person not in terms of what i look like but in terms of my experience and uh, the perspective that i bring to the table well we really want to thank everyone for their contributions in such a dynamic conversation I'm sure we could go on another hour and it's great to see you back on video, Ronaldo. <laughs> so uh, I'll kick it back to, to you, Amber, to give some concluding thoughts and, and then we'll turn it back over to Larissa. Uh, Denise, thank you. And to all our panelists, uh, what an amazing way to start at the conference. Uh, I really want to thank you uh, on behalf of uh, everyone. Uh, as you follow the uh, chat, you can see uh, what you have stimulated in people's minds. Clearly, there are uh, an enormous number of unanswered questions, and we apologize to everyone, including to ourselves, because we had another seven questions which we didn't get to. Um, not getting to all of the uh, questions, but everything you've said has uh, sparked enormous interest. And I think we'll, uh, we'll live with this conference for the rest of the week as well. So on, on behalf of Denise and myself, uh, really a thank you from the bottom of our hearts for um, starting us off in a phenomenal way. And uh, Larissa, with those few words, I'll turn that over to you. Thanks so much, Anver. And I can only echo your comments. We're absolutely grateful to each and every one of our panelists, Sabine, Celeste, Hans, Ronaldo, and certainly to you, Anver and Denise, for facilitating this. Um, I know it's no small feat when we scheduled an hour in the program. Um, with this being a virtual conference, we have to keep things tighter, so they tell us, uh, the experts in these things. I'm glad that we were able to run over and appreciate everyone's time. Um, for those of you who kind of follow CBI social media feeds, um, you've seen over the last number of months, um, we've been rolling out a CBIE podcast series to talk about, you know, key conversations and threads related to our work. 
Um, we're certainly going to uh, extend an invitation to today's panelists, among many other conference contributors, to join us uh, as part of that podcast series going forward and really look forward to hearing more, uh, as I know this is really just the beginning. Uh, so thank you all for your engagement. It was just so great uh, to, to just follow the conversation and, and our delegates' engagement in, in, in the chat function. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to visit the virtual exhibit hall and the World Pavilion if you have not had a chance to do so. Um, the first batch of concurrent sessions will begin at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, we invite you to arrive just a few minutes early uh, and also want to highlight that at 3 p.m. Eastern each day, uh, we have a dedicated time slot for uh, Francophone sessions uh, throughout the conference. Uh, so please check out the, uh, the event agenda to get more details. I think the biggest challenge, you know, um, is really not finding the time, but trying to selectively choose um, which sessions you'd like to connect to, as there are so many, so many rich presenters uh, over the course of the next five days. The good news, and you may have seen this in some of the messaging through our platform, as we invited you to sign up and set up your profile, is shortly after the conference, um, we are recording all of this, and so all of this will be available to you, either to repeat uh, and savor, or to connect to sessions that you might not be able to connect to in real time over the next five days. So, you know, fear not, there'll be plenty of opportunities to, to digest and, and mull over that information in these conversations, um, even following kind of the conference week. Um, so with that, I bid you all well. Thank you again to our panelists and to Deese and Anver. And as you know, this is part one of a two-part conversation. So we look forward to continuing this engagement tomorrow. So thanks everybody, and we'll see you online at the concurrent sessions at one o'clock. See you in the exhibit hall and the, and the World Pavilion. Take care, everyone. Could everyone stay on? So I think we're gonna do a quick pick. Indeed. Thanks, Denise. That was a remarkable session. Thank you all so very much. It really was remarkable. Thank you for having me. Same, and it was a Talk pleasure. About Ernie. Thank you. Talk about earning accelerator. This was it for me. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time and for squeezing in a little bit more of that time into your schedule today. It's greatly appreciated. So um, we'll follow up with photos shortly so you can share those and um, look forward to hearing more from us very, very soon. But thank you, Celeste, Sabine, Ronaldo, Hans, Denise, and Andrew. Thank, thank you. you. Have thank a good you. rest of your day. Thank bye you. Bye. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.